morning, Orchard Ridge. Woo-hoo! Morning, good morning. Good morning. This Take beautiful fall seat. morning, if everyone could just stand up. Woo! Our first song is going to be 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord. I think we look outside, we've got quite a few of those reasons we can bless his name. That's for sure. Stand up, stretch, deep breath. Thank the Lord for all that he's done in our lives.
worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. would 
die for our redemption whose resurrection means our rise there isn't time enough to sing all you have done but I have eternity transition to it, worshiping the Lord through prayer, through corporate prayer together. What a beautiful, beautiful uh, morning it is uh, outside. And of course here outside is really inside because we're got these windows open. Um, I'm going to use something that's really, it's in my sermon, but I'm going to take a, take a thing out of that and, and talk about it right now. You've heard the term theology. As we go to prayer, I want to consider a term that I'm, we're going to make up called neology. Um, and that means really two things. Usually when we think of ne, we're talking about uh, prayer. Um, of course, God can, you can pray standing up, um, lying down in any kind of position. But really that whole thing with bowing on bended knee. Wasn't there a boy band that sang a song called Unbended Knee? Um, it's an act of submission. Uh, the word of God says that the day will come when every knee will bow. That our knees will hit the ground and we will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. No matter what we've done on the earth, it will be plain someday. All will know and all will see. There's a lot in this world right now that we don't know. My 
list of things that I thought was important and I was, you know, praying for. Of course, the Lord can handle all of the trivial matters. But boy, doesn't the, the, the events, uh, the world events of the last week, eight days, kind of put a lot of things into perspective about what's important. And, um, and most of the things that are on my list when I look at that, I know where my kids are. Um, and so we are going to pray certainly for the peace and protection of Israel but for innocents everywhere where no matter what their ethnicity is um, this is a serious conflict and you can't watch any of that without it weighing heavily on our hearts and so um, let's express our neology and whether you decide to change your posture and come up and kneel. And by the way, if you've never done that, I encourage you to try it. It's not a religious exercise, but but for me, just doing that is my public declaration of my need for God. Um, So um, feel free to line these altars and maybe the need isn't a need at all, but you're bringing a prayer, an offering of thanksgiving. Your heart is full and you're grateful. And you, you just want to come and, and give God thanks. So we will pray certainly for the situation that we've talked about, but we also have many of our Orchard Ridgers that are running for World Vision, and that run is this morning down in Detroit. And so we're going to pray for them. Even more so, the people that are going to be touched because of what they're doing, the money that they raise. Clean water um, is a life changer for so many. And so we just want to pray for those communities that are going to be recipients. We have people that are fighting uh, illnesses, uh, cancers. We're going to pray for Jill Jones, for Joe Carley, Julie Antoon. And we're going to pray for every place and every church where this gospel is preached this morning, that it would bear fruit. And I'm praying that truth, Jesus said, I am the way, the what? Truth. We don't know what's true anymore. There's so many lies being pumped out everywhere and they sound so convincing. I just have to trust God that he's gonna sort out everything out. And he's the truth and uh, the truth will prevail in all matters of our lives uh, and everything. So let's be still, pastor's gonna stop talking. And uh, let's be still and know that he is God. Let's silence our devices and, and come before him with the spirit of just receiving whatever he has for us today.
to you a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Every breath that we breathe, every beat of our heart is a reason to praise you. You are good. So we just pause right now to not focus and not set our gaze on all of the problems, all of the challenges, all of the, the unresolved conflicts. We choose to set our gaze on you, Jesus, and give thanks for the many, many wonderful things that are right, not only in our lives, but in our world. Thank you that your kingdom is growing. Your kingdom will advance, and it doesn't matter how loud and how noisy chaos and evil get in the world around us and even in our own personal world. You said the gates of hell would never prevail against your holy church, the church that you're building. And so I'm praying right now, Father, that all of us, whether we're doing it literally or figuratively in our minds, I pray that we would all fall on bended knees that we would confess now by faith rather than later when it, it won't be an issue of faith because everyone will behold you and they will drop to a knee. We would like to drop to a knee before we can see you literally. By faith, we see you. We see you. And we, we, we our neology needs to uh, acknowledge that. So Father, um, be with those uh, that are, are running for a cause, and I lift up to you the recipients globally of the effort of World Vision and the Clean Water Run, the things that are going on with that. I pray that lives would be saved, quality of life would be enhanced and enriched, and Lord, I'm praying for the simple gospel of Christ that is not based on secret codes and secret knowledge and um, a long elaborate list of things that we must say and do and the simple gospel that Jesus paid it all. And if we believe and receive, we might have eternal life in him that begins now, not when we die. Thank you for the eternal life that is ours now in Christ. Outwardly, these bodies are wasting away, but inwardly, we are being renewed day by day by day. Within us is a stream of living water that will not ever run dry. And so I just pray that the, the reason that you created each one of us, that the reason that you created Orchard Ridge Church that we would all be a city on a hill, that we would all be a light that will not have a bowl put over it to be hidden, but we would shine the light of Christ into a thousand outposts of hope in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Open our eyes to the needs that are around us. Lord, help us to love the most obvious people like our husbands and our wives and our kids and our neighbors that, that you have put all around us. May those things get done before we would go on to weightier and bigger things. You know who needs the healing. I'm praying, dear God, that um, as the word is preached, not only in this pulpit, but wherever the gospel is preached on this day, may it truly be a day where we could say, as the Jews say, um, Shalom Shabbat. We pray Shalom, which means true peace. It's not just an absence of conflict, but it is wholeness of the person. We pray that the peace of Christ would rule in our hearts on this day that we have set aside to worship. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. <clears throat> wow. Good morning. I'm Pastor Leon. We're going to transition now to a time of worship.
by receiving of the tithes and offerings. And as the ushers would come forward, I want to thank you for your continued support here for the ministries at Orchard Ridge that happen on this campus, in our community, and around the world. Last week, you heard that we have had someone step up and say that if we can raise $15,000 toward our pavilion, that they would match that. I would like to tell you there's another 25 behind that. So if we as a church can raise uh, $40,000 amongst us, there's another 40, and that's going to get us really close to getting that pavilion started. We plan to break ground in the spring. That's a statement of faith. So as you plan for your Christmas giving, would you consider the pavilion part of your Christmas giving? Let's pray this morning. God in heaven, we are grateful for your goodness and how you have blessed us, each one of us. Financially, as we give back to you and recognize that all of our resources belong to you, the source. But as you blessed us with relationship, you blessed us with a church building, you blessed us with life in Christ. We pray that you would use us to extend that life to others. God in heaven, we love you and we worship you. And all God's people said, amen. How many of you are glad that we did not have our fall harvest thing yesterday? Look at all the hands go up, right? Lots of hands. Okay, so we postponed that a week, but in that postponement, we lost 14 volunteers. So if you raised your hand because you're glad we didn't have it yesterday and you're not volunteered for next Saturday, would you please see the halls out in the foyer next to the fireplace after a service today and let them know that you'll fill in one of those 14 spots? We'd really appreciate that. Um, the other announcements, I'll just be quick about it. The regular ministries are in your bulletin. that are happening this week. Please find a place to connect and make relationships and grow deeper in Christ uh, through Bible studies and through small groups. And um, so I think that's all the announcements I'm going to make today, Pastor Steve. Would you come? This morning, I'm going to pray over you. I don't do it every Sunday, but this morning I will because I know God's going to speak something great for, for us through you today. God in heaven, we thank you for Pastor Steve, for his leadership. Most importantly, Father, we thank you that he's following you. God, I pray that you would just bless him with your thoughts, with your words today. We pray, Father, you would soften the soils of our heart to receive what you have for us. And all God's people said. Well, we've been in the book of Colossians, you know that. This is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul from a jail cell, and he's writing to a church in Asia Minor, which would be modern-day Turkey. It's a church he's never been to. He um, is talking to in person, because that's the only way you could do it in that time, right? Um, he is speaking with a man by the name of Epaphras, who is the pastor who started this church. And um, Epaphras is concerned because there's this thing called, uh, theologians today, they call it the Colossian, the Colossian heresy. Because here are these young baby Christians. You know, and I alluded it to, to this in my prayer, but friends, never forget that the gospel is simple. It's a simple gospel. Jesus didn't, come and, 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 and feed to feed the giraffes. You know what I mean by that? He came to feed sheep. Well, down here. Down here. You keep it simple. I don't got to be so lofty in my theology, throwing around these big terms and whatever, and you got to do this and this. Oh, but you got to know that, and you got to, and this is going to happen. That's giraffes. Way up high. It's the simple gospel, which is what? It's what he did. It's not what you do. There's a lot of room for what you do after you receive, believe and receive what he did. On the other side of that, there's a lot to be said about what we do. More importantly, where does the power come for the things that, that are what we do? And so this, this letter, which we have carved up uh, hundreds of years after it was written into chapter and verse. We're, we're crossing the Rubicon, so to speak. We're going over from the first half, which is the question of who is Jesus? You know, you ever, you ever see somebody and you think you know who they are and then some people start saying other things about that person and 
that cast doubts and aspersions in your mind about who they are. And you're like, well, I think I know who they are. But you're telling me this. They're saying this. And we come up with this, who are you? And this is where this church is. Jesus. I thought I knew who he was. I, I, you know. And so Paul starts out in the first two chapters, not going to go through it all again, but he's knocking down these lies that, that appear in the form of philosophies. Some are, are Jews that just don't want to give up their old Jewish ways and they want to get every uh, Christian who was saved by grace circumcised and following every Old Testament law and tradition, blah, blah, blah. You've got some, it's a Greek influenced area. And so there is this, this philosophy of aestheticism, which is pious self denial. It's like fasting, but it's prideful. It's fasting on steroids. It's like, I want everybody to know, and like that kind of thing where I'm not going to do that. Or you've met Christians, haven't you? I don't do this, 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 this. And they will proudly list for you the, the things that they won't do. It's probably good that, that there are some things that we won't do. But the, the, the spirit in which that lives matters, right? Jesus didn't go around telling everybody, you know, all that. And then there was this philosophy of elevating angels almost to like where we would worship them. And then there was this Gnosticism, which was this, this idea that there was special knowledge and unique knowledge and, you know, only certain people could. Have. So all this stuff was, was working its way through. By the way, um, the word philosophy, when you break that down, philo, you know, Philadelphia, right, the city of brotherly love. Um, ph philos is like another form of the Greek words for love. So philosophy is the love of something. And then Sophia, we have any Sophias in here? I know we have some Sophias in our church. One of them had homecoming last night, so she's home resting. <laughs> oh, we have a Sophia. I went to high school with that Sophia's mom. Her name was Jennifer, awesome family. I'm gonna tell you what your name means. Sophia means knowledge or wisdom. And so philosophy is the love of knowledge or wisdom, and it makes its way into these thoughts. Now, you may be sitting there and saying, well, this couldn't happen today. I don't see any Gnostics at Orchard Ridge. I don't see any proclaimed angel worshipers at Orchard Ridge or whatever, but the enemy is, is sneaky. There are always going to be philosophies that will come and try to complicate the simple gospel. The simple gospel that saves the five-year-old child as much as it saves the 85-year-old child because we're all children. It doesn't matter how old you are. There are all things that we will eventually know and behold. I just want to fly through this. I want to do it last week, but we didn't have time for it. These are some philosophies of now. You've heard these things. I know you have. And I want to confront them. And in a minute, we'll, we may watch that video and we might not. I'm preaching today, Bob. He's like, do whatever you want to do. I'm ready. <clears throat> Here's one. You ready? Follow your heart. Boy, that sounds good. Can we do the one with the, with the script? There's another. Yeah, there we go. Follow your heart has ended more marriages, caused more addictions, mutilated more bodies, destroyed more souls, ended more lives than you can imagine. It's one of hell's most effective slogans. Don't follow your heart, follow the one who created it. I'll say something into that philosophy of follow your heart. It's also, it's tied into, if it feels right, it must be right. I mean, it's an exception to this. I know it says that, but for me, like I just, God's telling me it's a special thing between he and me. That's a lie. Don't forget that Lucifer, you know what the name Lucifer means? It means light bearer. He comes to you as an angel of light. Even though he is dark, he will come and present that, this thing as light. And so 
You can follow your heart depending on what or who is in your heart. If you're listening to Jesus Christ within, then follow your heart. But the follow your heart thing has got to be leaned up against the scripture. There, there's no exceptions to that. Okay? Now, does it mean that I can't be, you know, if I sin, I can't, there's no, I'm done? No. But there will be consequences. And that's not me saying it. That's a loving pastor communicating that. Philosophy number two that likes to work its way into the church in our world. Be true to yourself. I think Shakespeare said it, didn't he? To thine own self be true. Right? I think that's a Shakespearean quote, my thespian side of me from my MSU days. Be true to yourself. Um, Jesus said it like this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself. Huh. Remember that. Being a disciple, and remember how we ended last week. We talked about the distinction of Jesus as Savior versus Jesus as my Lord and my God, and I'll revisit that in a moment, but to your own self be true. If we want to be a Christ follower, there will be moments, I guarantee you, I've had them where my heart and my desires wanted a thing, and God said no. And you know what? Give it enough time, and he will always show himself as to why you were not to have the thing. You got to trust. Trust in who he is and what he says in his word. Here's a philosophy that's a lie that likes to work its way in. It's believe in yourself. Now, in context, yes, you should have a confidence. You are made in the image of God. He has gifted you. I'm not into, um, you know, the flagellation where people beat themselves and you're worthless, you know, humility to the point of robbing you of your value. Absolutely not. You should feel good about who you are, who he has made you to be. Young girls and women that have these uh, disorders that are tied into an image in a mirror in what they see on TikTok or what they see in magazines, that is not of God. So, yes, believe in yourself, the one that he has created you to be, all of that. But there's a philosophy that says that and means something different. It's a philosophy that says believe in yourself and, and it, it voids God out. You are the only one that you can count on. You are the only one that can do it. You believe in you and you can do anything. The thing that comes through in that is you. You, 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 you. I believe in the Christ that is within me to guide me, to direct me, to reveal to me day by day. Not, you're not going to get the downloaded plan for your life on a PDF um, today, but you'll get the downloaded PDF for your life moment by moment by moment. And that's a walk of faith. Right? And that's why we have to walk in step with the Spirit. And that takes trust. But it's amazing in those moments when we see things starting to click and come together in the, the synchronicity of, what, of how God works. But we have to live by faith. Here's another false philosophy. Live your truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the truth. Live your truth is a, is a statement of relativity. What it means is, is that there's, this false philosophy is that there's multiple truths. You just figure out what your truth is. That's your path. I have my path. Everybody's got a path. Jesus, for all that he, don't make him into something he's not. He has said unequivocally, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father. Nobody gets to God unless they do it through me. I'm the only portable that is legitimate. All other ways are, are not, you know, well, Pastor Steve, what about the people that never heard of Jesus and this and that? And the other? He'll get that right. What are you worried about? Stay in your lane. That's not your lane. 
Your lane is to be obedient to what he's called you to do. You don't think he's going to do right by those people? It'll all work out. But he's the truth. Last one, and then we'll move on. As long as you're happy, who cares? It's not hurting anybody. I'm happy. Why not? Right? That, that is a philosophy that, that is elevating pleasure as a higher thing than, than principle. I'd rather have my God-given principles than just my pleasure. It's not happy, as long as it makes me happy or somebody's happy. This is what Jesus said in Mark 8, 36. What will it profit a man or woman if they gain the whole world, but they lose their soul? You can be happy, you can get a whole lot, but at the end of the day, what you have done, now this, I think this passage in Corinthians is talking about, um, and it's not gonna be up there because it's just popping into my head right now, but there's a passage that talks about all of us as believers. It's what you've done on this earth. You're gonna pass through what will be like a, a purifying, like as if a flame. And the only thing that passes through that that will translate from this life into the next will be the things that are done for the kingdom of God. Everything that is done for just your own, uh, just pleasure, or whatever. And by the way, God, do some things that are pleasurable. I mean, no, we're not a killjoy here. God is the one who gave you a Sabbath. He, he gave you seasons of rest. He, I think he would wish that we would all take more vacations when we need to do that because he can get through to us more. I mean, uh, not killing fun, but it's all about, yeah, I think you get it. So these are some philosophies that I just think that we need to kind of be on our guard about. Now, today's passage, because now we're crossing over. Now it's not a question about who is Jesus. If he is the one that is, has all authority, if he was all God and all man, if he truly did rise from the dead in bodily form, this is all in Colossians 1 and 2, and Paul is trying to say to them, you're being confused about who Jesus is. I'm going to clear all that up right now. He is these things, and I'm not going to preach those sermons again. Go watch it. But if he is these things you are going to have to decide if he is simply Savior. And remember, some of you weren't here last week, but we ended the service with a simple analogy of a firefighter that saves somebody from the burning building. And you know you feel grateful. You got pulled from the fire. You might give that person a gift. You might send them a card every, once a year. You, there might be things you do for the firefighter, but you're probably not going to fall down on your knee and start to worship the firefighter. Quite honestly, that'd probably make them feel a little weird too. Um, but that's a savior. A lot, don't confuse. A lot of people have Jesus as savior. He saved you. He's fire insurance for when you die. You don't want to go to hell. He saves you out of circumstances. I'm in a jam. Call Je what are you going to do? Hit the red button and call Jesus. He's my savior. But don't forget Thomas, who fell when he saw the resurrected Christ, he fell down and he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, get up. Now stop doubting and believe. So as we ask the question about who is Jesus, you will not, and this is why I had to mention it again. We're going to start reading through chapter 3. And people, you're going to be like, how can I? The bar is so high for what I am called to live out. See, there's a process. There's, there's the head that has to go to the heart. And then it has to go to the feet, into the hands, into our mouths that we confess. Um, you will not have any success and don't even try living out Colossians 3 and 4 without the help of the Holy Spirit. Just won't. I mean, in fact, the opposite might even happen. You might have your Bible with you, highlighter ready, you're rocking and rolling. Yeah, I'm going to do this Christian thing. But 
and it's in your head, and it's in your heart, you want to, but you're going to go out there and try to live it. Theology, neology, and then there's biology. you got to be it. Hey, nothing wrong with uh, the, the bumper sticker that tells everybody how much you love Jesus. If you're into tattoos and that's your thing, it's not my thing, maybe it's your thing, and you want to tell everybody how much you love Jesus on your skin as a canvas and you got a cross and a verse and all that, that's fine. That's not your biology, though. At the end of the day, you got to live it. It's not what I just post on my personal Facebook page. It's not just what the things, the slogans and the things that I put out there. I got to live this thing. Proof. You want proof? Let's, let me give you some proof. I'm not just saying this. This is, this is Christ. Go to 1 Peter 2.21. Peter spent some time with Jesus. He understood how it worked. He said, to this you were called. You walking with Christ is a calling. Never forget that. It's not just a decision of which faith you're going to be. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. It does matter what I do. I'm going to do a wedding this afternoon, 3.30, young, beautiful couple. And they're going to say vows. I've said this before here. I'm going to say it again here. They're going to say a lot of things of all that they're going to be to that other person. And every person that's going to sit there that's married including this pastor, knows that they ain't going to keep all that. They're going to try. They're going to bring their A game. So why do we say it? Why do we set them up? It's because before you even begin, they need to know what God's intention for what this is, is. So when you step out of bounds, you can throw the flag and get back in the game. See, if we don't say any of that, it's just, it's ambiguous. It's, it's like, well, how do I know what's right then? I got to know what's right and wrong. And so Colossians 3 and 4 in these things are there to say, this is what I am calling you to be. You have been called. Christ has given us the example so that we should follow in his steps. And by the way, you won't be this side of heaven sinless, meaning like Adam was before the fall. But you will sin less, a whole lot more or less. See, the flesh will, as soon as God helps you get victory in one area of your life, the depth of our depravity is such that here comes another thing. It's like field stones in the field. The farmer, every spring, you know, they break the ground and they till it and and lift it out and whatever. They get all the field stones gone. Back in the day, over at, West, uh, at the orchards a mile from here, they actually had a big mountain of field stones that were from that. And after the season is over, it likes, wow, the farmer could say, oh, glad I got that over with. My, my field's going to look awesome forever. No, because next spring's coming. And the ground brings forth new rocks. There are parts of me that are so unchristlike that I haven't even come to grips with yet because <laughs> it's so deep, deep within. But as I walk with him, he's going to bring it lovingly up to the surface. And he said, you thought you were all mine. Peter said, I'll die for you. Right. You're going to deny me three times tonight. When I get victory over one area in due season, he's going to say, all right, now we're going to give you, we're going to start working on it. Whoa, I didn't even know that was in me. I didn't even know that. Do you get it? This is, this is how it works. Now, 1 John 2, 3 through 6 says this. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but that doesn't do what he commands. They're a liar, and the truth isn't in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him lives as Jesus lived. Now, as I said, are you going to be the perfect Christ? No, but the standard has been established. Now, let's read the passage finally, right? Finally. 
Colossians 3, 1 through 17. And as we read it, I needed to set all that up so that you know the framework of where we're going. So now we're crossing over. Now it's practice. Paul is saying Jesus is those things. Now this is, if he is those things, here's what you need to be and do. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life that you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. I have people ask me that, that question. Does it matter you know, how I talk or, or whatever else? That's a whole sermon unto itself about what inappropriate language means and is. Some of it can be swearing. I think that's the lower of the list. But certainly lying and gossiping and slander are bad language to God. Right? Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of the creator, of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, is God's chosen people holy and dearly loved clothe yourselves with compassion kindness humility gentleness patience bear with each other and forgive one another if you have any if any of you has a grievance against someone forgive as the lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Wow, what an anthem verse for our praise band. Wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I went this past week and saw, uh, Brett and I went and saw the Romeo Family Theater there, the one in the strip mall, um, the movie The Blind. Okay, it's the... Uh, the Phil Robert, I'm not a hunter, but you know, the Duck Dynasty people and the quack quack things that have made them millions of dollars. And it's the story of grandpa, I think it's Phil, I think that he's the older one. It's his story of conversion. And, and the, the, the title of the movie, The Blind, isn't, isn't about somebody going blind. I kept waiting in the movie, I'm like, who's gonna lose their sight here? But, but I'm not a hunter. <laughs> The whole thing's in a discussion from a blind. It's two hunters, and they're blind. And it's this conversation that they're having, and he's retelling the story of how he found Christ. It's a beautiful story. But the thing in that story that, that stands out, like, he had a, a bad upbringing. Um, he's not alone in that story. Friends, you know, if you've had a bad upbringing... I hope as the body of Christ, we can sympathize with you, and in some cases, we can empathize with you. But do not accept 
the lie that that's the end of your story. Don't play the victim. You have been given all of the resources of heaven at your disposal to be an overcomer of any kind of a background. This is why God gave us each other. He gave us the church to mutually encourage one another. Nobody in the, you know what God's answer is for loneliness? You know, my whole, yeah, if you desire to, to find the love of your life and all that, um, what a wonderful thing this afternoon that two people found each other and they're going to, you know, start a family and do all those nice things. That's, that's beautiful. But that's not everybody's story. What's God's answer for a lonely person? I've thought long and hard about that. It's the church. Some people are lonely, by the way, in their own marriage. So let's just get that out of the way. You got this. He gave the body of Christ to us to fulfill the longings for companionship, albeit asexual. Um, but I got this. And then pets. <laughs> you got he gave us that too. Okay. Um, all right. Circling back to this. Where's my, oh good, I got a little bit of time. I love it. There's some things that jump out to me in verses one through four. Uh, George Harrison, uh, he was a Beatle. Okay, young people, this is an ancient, ancient band <laughs> made up of these old, old men that some are not still living, but they were young, as we all were at one time. George Harrison wrote a song. No, he didn't write it. He covered it. He took a song that had already been written in 1962, and in 1987, he did it, and it was pretty successful. Um, I got my mind set on you. Remember that one? I got my mind set on you. I got my mind. That one? Yeah. Well, you can look at the lyrics. It's a simple lyric, but he's basically trying to get the girl that he's got his mind set on and he comes to the conclusion to get this job done it's going to take a whole lot of money a whole lot of spending money remember that right <laughs> and it's going to take patience and time and all these other things you know what this paul here not his bandmate paul this paul the apostle paul is saying set your mind Set your minds, before I tell you all that you're going to need to be, get your mind set on things above. And he uses two things. I love it. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is. The heart. What is the heart? It's not the beating. We, we do that, but it's not, it's not the organ. It's that chamber of your innermost being where your affections and your deepest held hopes and dreams reside, which is probably up here. But wherever that is, that's your heart. He's saying, set your hearts on things above because everything down here is wasting away. That new car that you just bought from one of our car salespeople at this church is no longer new, it's a used car as you drive it off the lot. Now you're driving a used car. And it gets the first scratch and the first bump from the cart at Kroger. And everything is in a constant state of disrepair, including you and me. So set your mind on things above. We keep chasing after things that are down below. Hearts and minds. And then he says, when Christ, who is your life? This is a, a chapter, there's 17 verses that, that speak to what is life and what is death. He said, Christ is your life. Phil Robertson lost it all. He lost his, his bride of his youth, his children, in a deep addiction to alcohol was living in a cesspool that he had created in some trailer that was, I mean, it was literally trash in the trailer. I mean, he was living in all that. And a pastor who cared got involved in his life. And it's just a beautiful scene in the film where they show him going in to the water of baptism, which was down in Louisiana, and I was fearful of what was gonna get him because he was getting baptized. And here he is in this swamp, 
and the pastor, and he, and he speaks, and he says, I am dead to the old man. I am raised to new life in Christ. And that pastor put him under and brought him out. I say praise to God. And so Christ, who is your life, appears. You'll appear with him. Verse 5, there are some things that need to get a death sentence. Put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature. And again, I'll say it again. This will never, ever be possible without the help of the Holy Spirit. It is a leaning into the Holy Spirit, and you will trip, and you will stumble, and you will fall. And by the way, the greatest opportunity for any of us to have success in our desire to walk as Jesus did, you, you can't do it alone. You got to get into a men's group or a woman's group. You got to get uh, form a group of three of people that you trust and tell them and get real about what your, your issues are and to get that support. It's amazing by just articulating some of the things we wrestle with. And they're all here, by the way. Anger, rage, malice, slander. I, I've called some people on the phone and, and, and how they answer is very... Um, crude and abrasive and then i say oh yeah it's pastor steve and then it <laughs> there is a transformation the holy spirit shows up and then they're the nicest person ever um hey that stuff's in all of us if you think that's pressure talk to a pastor i gotta be i gotta be like cognizant and aware that i am walking in christ everywhere i go and I always haven't gotten that right. I've had to go back and apologize in businesses when I just didn't act as Jesus would have me act. Um, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from our lips. The first step of being like Christ is coming to him and admitting that you are not. Humble. Lord, man, I, want, I see you. I want to be you. I'm not you. Would you put me under new management? Would you put me under construction? We got some more field stones, Jesus. My, my field is littered with them. Will you help me look, get these rocks out of the field? Put them over on a big stack on the side? Because I want a harvest. I'm not gonna have a good harvest if I've got rocks in my field everywhere. I wanna have a harvest of Christ-likeness. Put on the new self. I like how we, this term of almost like clothing. He even says it in verse 12. Um, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with the things that are the opposite of what I just read. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Clothe yourself. You know, that is in stark contrast if we're using the metaphor of clothing to Hebrews 12, which says, throw off, like take off everything that hinders and the sin that easily entangles. Get that off of you and clothe yourselves with these things. You realize why we wear clothing, don't you? It goes back to the Garden of Eden where they used to, the two of them ran around naked and didn't know it. <laughs> they weren't even aware that they were naked. They were just how they were. Like, like deer are naked and they don't think about it. They're just deer. That was us. That was us running around like that. But when sin entered the picture, there was a knowledge. There it is again, that, that the knowledge of good and evil, they were aware of their nakedness. And what did they feel? They felt what you would feel if you were naked right now, a whole lot of shame. That's what they felt. And God covered their shame. In a foreshadowing of Christ on the cross, an animal was killed skins were made and a covering to cover their bodies was was given to them and so isn't it interesting that we're told about we're using this analogy of clothing ourselves but i'll go beyond that this isn't just an outward layer this is an inward work i don't just clothe myself with the an outward thing but deep down i'm just awful and still full of no he the transformation is inside out and this is why don't judge somebody who is new in christ especially if they're still 
talking and living like some of their old stuff, but they've had this new birth experience because what happens is it works from the inside out. And it's going to be, God may not pull that big, that one rock that you keep seeing that you're, is your stumbling block. It's not theirs, it's yours. He may not lift that rock out because he's got a bigger one he's got to deal with them right now. So let's not judge each other. And this is why in verse 13, bear with each other and forgive one another. We got to bear with each other. What does that mean? It means put up with each other in love. I'd go to that church, but so-and-so is there. Can't stand her. (laughs) Got to find a new church. Really? No, bear with each other. Put up with each other because guess what? God's putting up with you. Oh, man, he's putting up with Pastor Steve. He's bearing with me. Thank God he's not giving up on me. So the Lord will, I've had some, there's been seasons of the life of this church where maybe somebody has moved away and I wish them well, but silently I'm like, all right, it's gonna be a new day at this church because God's led them elsewhere. The next week I get another one. You're, you're gonna get you're gonna get some difficult people. I, I'm just being real with you up here. You know it. You live it. Listen. You get a difficult person gone in your life. Take a deep breath and enjoy the view, because tomorrow he's gonna send you another one. Because that's just the way it is. No group of people should have all the bad people. He's going to do that. And by the way, that's more for you. And I'm sure I'm, a, I'm sure I'm a bad person in somebody's thing too, whatever. We're bearing with one another. It's his way of shaping. Listen, when, when rocks are against rocks and water hits the rocks and whatever, you do that over time and that stone is smooth. It's his way of shaping us, molding us informing us. And in conclusion, because we need to do this, above all else, these things that we're putting on, put on love, because it binds the whole thing together. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Do you notice how all these things that he's saying have nothing to do with what these lies and these philosophies were that were coming in? He says, be thankful twice in the end. Sing. I don't care if you have a bad voice. When that band gets up here, you sing. Sing. Because I don't, that's of God. Music is the language of the soul. I, I don't, people, you can hear, I can hear uh, Andrea Bocelli sing a song. I don't know what the heck the guy is saying, but man, that's good. <laughs> it's beautiful. So when they're singing, Sing. You know, and, and bear with one another if you got somebody next to you that's struggling. Sing, make music to the Lord. It, it's a spiritual act of worship. All right, we're done. And I hope that our theology can go to our neology, can be our biology, and we can be people that are a part of the new creation. I'm going to leave you with this verse. It actually is an Old Testament verse. It's King David, who was a man after God's own heart, but he was not a man without sin. And he got caught in a trap. That's what sin is. It's a trap. It presents itself to be something that's wonderful and life-giving, and then it becomes something that's entangled and brings death and destruction. But look at what... David said, when all of it got exposed, he was held accountable by a prophet by the name of Nathan. And now he was broken and contrite, and he said, create in me a pure heart, O God. This is how you can live chapter three. There, he's got to do a heart transplant. Not the organ, the chamber where you keep your desires, your hopes, He needs to give you the desires of your heart. That's a misinterpreted verse. Uh, That's not like, oh, wow, delight myself in the Lord. He'll give me the desires of my heart. I'll get everything I ever want. No. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will empty you of you, 
And now he will bring in desires. He will give you the desires of your heart. That chamber, that inner chamber of what I want, now starts getting God-imported things in it. And he's giving me the desires of my heart. Do not cast me, David said to the Lord, from your presence. I need you. Or take your Holy Spirit from me, because I'm in bad shape if that happens. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The joy of the Lord is our, it's our strength. You're weak, you're feeling weak, it's because you don't have joy. Where does your joy come from? David said, restore the joy of my salvation. If you're feeling joyful and thankful for your, where you're standing in Christ, you're strong. You're gonna get lifted out of your, whatever you're going through, I promise you. Jesus, send us from this place with hands and feet and in our very being. May we radiate who you are to a world that lives in darkness just as we once did and may they see the light and may we be your light. In your name we ask it, amen.
of truth today? I sure did. Let's pray. Father and God, thank you for transforming us from the inside out. Thank you for the work that you're doing in each one of us. We pray, God, now as we leave this place that you would go with us, that you would help us, help others to reach the throne of grace. Help us to put on the clothes of compassion. We love you and we worship you and all God's people said, amen. Remember, sign up for helping out on Saturday before you leave out in the foyer, and thank you for coming today.